we have a situation in our country where the truth has been so far spun out of reality that we're believing the narrative that the mainstream media is cramming down our throat. I'm, I'm talking about the January 6th situation. Yes, it's real. Yes, it happened, but not the way that everyone thinks. And this narrative and this trying to get your career amplified at the DOJ or the FBI or the newspaper has completely wrecked thousands of American lives. To help us better understand that, I have documentary filmmaker Josh Phillip here. Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a real pleasure. And thanks for having me, especially on a topic that YouTube doesn't like. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah. That, that's okay. We want, we're about the truth here on our channel. My, my uh, viewers love the truth. Um, yeah. So first of all, I wanted to have you on. My, my father-in-law is a, a filmmaker, and he recently made the movie The Real Dr. Anthony Fauci, which documents with extensive proof what a piece of human garbage Dr. Fauci is. And now all these truths are coming out that he lied to us during the lockdowns. They misrepresented things. They covered things up. Uh, just lie after lie after lie. I feel like the same thing has happened. I believe COVID was real. And then they put the spin on it in order to make people afraid. I think the same thing has happened with uh, the Jan 6 situation. Do you agree or disagree with that? I, I completely agree. And you know, um, just 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 as some background on this, you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. I've been an investigative journalist since 2008 and a journalist at the time since 2006. You know, this has been my wheelhouse. And on January 6, I was there covering it. I was at the Trump speech at the Ellipse. You know, I was there very early in the morning with all the other journalists. All the mainstream media was there. And of course, you know, marched over to the Capitol after Trump said, you know, because there was a there was an arranged event there. It was scheduled. They even had a set a speaker stage and everything set up. It was they had permits for it. It was a normal event. And he walked over there and then suddenly nobody could make phone calls. Nobody could communicate. I got separated from my film crew. And so I was just sit. I was just standing in a parking lot, you know, taking selfies with people, you know. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on because my experience in January 6th was that it was a very peaceful event. There were families, there were kids there. Um, it was a lot of like MAGA supporters. I didn't see any violence. I, you know, people were mad, of course, because it was, it was an extension of the stop the steal rallies where people were worried about the election being stolen, you know, which was the context of it. And the planned event that day, what we thought we were going to be witnessing was what Trump was saying which was he said that the members of Congress, as they count the Electoral College votes, were going to use that stage to show to the public every single piece of election fraud, every piece of evidence. That's what was supposed to happen on January 6th. That, that was what Trump was really talking about. And when he was talking about the importance of it, that was the context. The process through which Americans were supposed to be shown on national TV all of the evidence of election fraud was stopped, not because of the you know, raid on the Capitol building, but instead by the pipe bomb. And when the pipe bomb threat happened, which we still don't know anything about, I don't know if you've seen the recent reports on it, yeah. but people are like, hey, uh, I think Jack Prasovic said it, hey, that pipe bomb, because we got a picture of it, looks like the training ones the FBI uses. And, you know, I've interviewed EOD experts, explosive, ex explosive ordnance disposal experts, and you'll know that uh, IEDs, improvised explosive devices, have signatures. Um, you can tell which ones are made by Al-Qaeda. You can tell which ones are made by Hezbollah. You can tell which ones are made by the FBI. And these are FBI pipe bombs, interestingly. Um, you know, not saying that maybe someone maybe didn't serve with them previously, but it's raising some questions online currently of, hey, uh, so what do we know about the guy who left that there? You can track down grandma and you, you can hunt down the guy in, in the woods out in Alabama, but you can't find the guy who left the pipe bomb on January 6th. And the best thing he can give us is this choppy video footage. Um, now, I'm just adding to that though. So my, my experience of January 6th was relatively peaceful. I was shocked when I went back to my hotel room. I saw the way it was being framed because that was absolutely not what I saw. Um, but since then, though, Epic Times, we've, of course, done a lot of reporting on it. Uh, we were able to get access to a lot of the unreleased video footage. 
And we used that in the first documentary we made, which was called The Real Story of January 6th. And we showed actually based on video footage we personally obtained that there was severe evidence of violations of use of force. There was severe evidence of entrapment by the police uh, that many of the people who did in fact carry out acts of violence because there was violence and rioting that day. Absolutely there was. Uh, but it was not the majority of the crowd. And interestingly, most of that crowd was in the first wave who did that while Trump was still speaking at the ellipse. And that raised some issues of who who were those people? Were they FBI agents? Were they Antifa? Were they paid agitators? We don't know. Some of them we don't know. Um, regardless, it did not represent the entire crowd. And regardless of that, there was massive evidence of police violating use of force laws, which could... Uh, be, constitute what you would call fruit of the poisonous tree, uh, which is where if crimes were committed in the act of prosecuting a crime, the entire thing can get thrown out. Uh, the tree is poisoned by the, you know, by the very act that uh, began the whole thing. So if police were in fact violating laws to do this, yeah, that would get the whole thing thrown out. Then we did another special feature um, because Epic Times was one of only three media it was granted access to all of the unreleased footage. Um, and that was with, that was, you know, the, the House of Representatives gave three media access. It was us, just the news, and I can't remember the third one. And so, you know, my colleague, Joe Hanneman, who is in the new documentary, uh, he was able to go to Congress. They have, they have a, a special location where we're actually not allowed to disclose, where they let you view all this footage and the story is very different. Um, Absolutely. It is not what you were shown. And uh, we showed a lot of that. Uh, most importantly, as well, we were able to show evidence that the January 6th committee, which was, of course, Democrat run. Yes, they brought on two Republicans, but the Republicans they brought on were people who voted to impeach Donald Trump. And they were selected by the Democrats, not by the Republicans. In fact, the, the individuals selected by the Republicans were rejected by then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. They refused to appoint them and they handpicked people who would vote in line with them. We were able to demonstrate with video evidence that they had been doctoring evidence. They were altering videos in order to make their, their claims. Uh, this included, for example, one video clip where it looked like a guy was, it looked like a Trump supporter was assaulting a police officer. And that's the way the media framed it. That's the way the January 6th committee framed it. But what they did was they removed the audio. And if you include the audio, you hear the guy saying, oh, I'm sorry, officer. Uh, we ran into each other. I'm sorry. Uh, let, let's get up together. Let me help you up. Oh, sorry, officer. They ran into each other. They tumbled down together. The guy's apologizing to the police officer saying, we're going to get up together. Let me help you up. They remove that and they dramatize it to make it look like the guy's assaulting a police officer. And you see things like this across the board. We have video evidence of individuals who testified before Congress lying about everything they said, lying about it. One of the individuals who you know, was testifying before Congress, he's saying where he was that day and everything. Like that. You, you watch him on the video cameras and he's slinking around like a scared cat. You, he had, there's one video where he goes between two statues and just fades into the statues like Homer Simpson into a bush. You know, you know what I mean? Like yeah. he's hiding. It, it, he, he misrepresented the entire thing. He lied before Congress. Technically, he perjured himself. Uh, but you don't see that getting prosecuted. Anyways, the, the story is very different than what you're being told. And we've, of course, documented this and shown it. And I believe that as the narrative changes, you're going to watch this evidence become better known, especially as they release the videos publicly. Uh, nothing we've reported has been proven false. All of it has been vindicated as more evidence has come out. And I believe that's going to become more and more so. The new documentary we did, which is the one we're talking about now, people can see it on January 6th, realstory.com is about the weaponization of the justice system. Because, you know, we, yeah, people have their own opinions on protesting and parading. And, and look, there were, Trump, there were Trump supporters who were violent that day. It was absolutely not the majority of them, but there were some. And depending on which side of it you want to focus on, you can frame your narratives however you want. But the bigger topic is the long-term impact of January 6th and the way it has been used to try to accuse half the country of being terrorists, uh, of the way that the justice system has been weaponized, of the way that our terror designators have been used, and of the way that 
federal agencies have been asked to, you know, have agents commit acts that some of them believe are violations of the Constitution and violations of their oaths to the Constitution, many of whom have been punished by the agencies, many of whom have stepped forward as whistleblowers and because of that have been punished, which should not be legal and maybe in the future will deemed to have been illegal. And also we're watching as our constitutional protections are being eroded as um, you know, terror designators and terror investigations are turned from what we would normally think of as real terrorists, people blowing up buildings and committing mass acts of violence against people who merely uh, expressed their dis dissatisfaction with the government and did carry out a protest. And even the worst of those were not close to what we saw with like the Black Lives Matter protest, by the way. There weren't people torching cars with Molotov cocktails or, you know, anything like that, which we saw with the, those. And the people who did that notably got, got off with a slap on the wrist. Um, and that's raising questions of, well, what does this mean for the future of our constitutional protections? Um, are, you know, because terrorism laws, it's, it's pre-crime. That's what it is. Uh, ter the terror laws, you know, post 9-11 and George Bush with, um, you know, the Patriot Act and so on, created a type of pre-crime because, you know, the federal government take it. You know, I think back after 9-11, a lot of us were on board with it. Oh, Al Qaeda is trying to kill all of us. Yeah, investigate them. And many people had had good faith in the government that they were going to use it for legitimate reasons. They're, they have they have to monitor for terror threats. And that meant that they had to be able to surveil communications, monitor suspected terror organizations, and so on, in order to watch for plans for crimes, meaning law enforcement being directed at things, at crimes that had not yet been committed, pre-crime. And the terror designators create that. The issue now is the Biden administration is using that not against terrorists, but by framing patriotic Americans as terrorists, we've seen, for example, evangelical Christians are now framed as extremists. We've seen that Catholics are framed as extremists. We're seeing that if you protest in front of an abortion clinic, you are called an extremist. We watched as parents protesting at uh, you know, parent teacher meetings, for example, that the, the teachers associations uh, called on the FBI to investigate these individuals as terrorists. And so we've watched the designation of terrorists go from someone carrying out mass acts of violence for religious purposes to people who merely have political beliefs, political ideology, the MAGA, MAGA extremists, as Biden would call them, MAGA, right, uh, as, as representing the same type of threat as terrorists. And I think the long term impact of January 6th is that that was the narrative used as you know, they keep saying that it's the new Pearl Harbor, it's the new 9-11. Although it was not that on par with deaths or anything else, you could argue that in terms of how it changed uh, the justice system, of how it changed the way that terror designators are used against peaceful Americans, that uh, it was actually very similar. Um, and that that is what the focus of the new documentary is on. Yeah, I, I noticed... Um former uh fbi peter struck the the guy who lied about donald trump uh being in bed with russia and being a secret mole for russia that same guy they keep allowing back on tv and every opportunity he gets he says that jan 6 was worse than 9 11 where three thousand people were killed uh by buildings that came down uh, and comparing that to the Capitol, where the majority, the vast majority, were peaceful. They, they were there. They were minding, minding their business. Uh, one of your competitor uh, news agencies has the evidence. People are, like, singing and waving flags, and then out of nowhere, in comes the percussion grenade. Boom! And everybody panics. They don't know what to do. And then, boom, that's when the cameras come on. They start filming all of the pushing and all of that. And it, it, it's like, you you would have needed to be a filmmaker and think these scenes out beforehand. That That's what it looks like to me. It looks like we were watching something that was like, okay, 
it, it's one of those um, Hulu originals where the people don't know that they're the actors and we're going to put them through situations to see how they react. And they didn't react well, but I don't know that I would react very well to a percussion grenade going off by my head or my wife's head or my children's yeah. head. Um, but uh, there, there's no way that this thing is on par with 9-11. Yeah. And well, and, I, I, yeah. I think it's disgusting that they tried to they their vitriol towards Donald Trump is so intense that they would literally compare one of the worst things that ever happened on native soil uh, to to the January 6th situation. Yeah. Well, briefly on the on the you know, point of it looks like it was like a like a documentary, like like it was planned or staged. Remember that Nancy Pelosi had her own family there with a the film crew that day. Yes. You know, while while she rejected uh, having no climb fences, and she rejected having, for example, the the mobilization of the National Guard. Trump is president. He, the, the president cannot deploy the National Guard. He can authorize it. Trump authorized it, but the deployment was rejected by Nancy Pelosi and by Muriel Bowser, um, you know, mayor of uh, Washington, D.C. And meanwhile, you also had the, ch the chief of police, you know, Capitol Police, begging for support. And they, they denied him. The Democrats denied him. Remember, Nancy Pelosi, as then House Speaker, uh, was in charge of the Capitol Police that day. And so the lack of security could be heavily blamed on her. And she was more interested in making sure there was a film crew present than there was proper security. And that, that should say a lot to everybody. Um, on the issue of the concussion grenades, yeah, we actually showed that footage. We have body cam footage. We have surveillance footage. Uh, we, we have that footage. Um, the whole picture of what took place uh, included in both the original documentary, The Real Story of January 6th, and in the special feature we did. And yeah, what happened was bizarre. So before, before the protesters were really doing much, you had police, and it was only a handful of police. It wasn't the majority of them. You had, you had one police officer. We actually have his badge name. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I, don't, I don't want to falsely accuse anybody. But you had one officer who was just unhinged, and you can hear him on the body cam footage screaming, we need more munitions. We need more munitions. He's grab, he's pushing other officers. He's literally grabbing uh, these, you know, sh these uh, concussion grenades off their vests. He's pulling the pins and just lobbing them randomly into the crowd. Now, for the analysis on this, we actually brought in one of the top use of force experts in the entire world. And this is this is one of the guys brought in to analyze for courts. You know, if you if you're having to stand trial, used who is often considered the top expert on saying whether there were violations of use of force. And he was shocked. He was he was shocked by what we showed him, because he was saying, I mean, it wasn't just that. It was it was police lobbing these um, these grenades that shoot out these little like pellets, and you know they, they do cause pretty bad injuries. Um, you're throwing them deep into the crowd uh, where people are closely, you know, people are gathered close, meaning you can, you can kill people. Uh, you can just, you can cause serious injury. You had police firing down downwards on the crowd from the scaffolding, um, which is a violation of use of force. It's illegal to do that. Cause if you hit somebody in the eye, you blind them. If you hit them in the head, you can kill them. They're firing down into the crowd. Uh, and they're also tossing uh, tear gas grenades. And in fact, one of the reasons why the police broke the line and fled into the Capitol was not because they were pushed in by the protesters, but because they tear gassed themselves because they were downwind from their own tear gas. And it's all on camera. You can you can watch it happening. They they tear gassed themselves, <laughs> and they were also using that without proper equipment because they were not granted the riot gear that they needed. For that, you know, that it was it was, again, poor planning. And you could thank Nancy Pelosi and Muriel Bowser for that. Um, but, yeah, without a doubt, uh, one of the one of the issues you have is that if you're using those types of munitions, you're doing one of two things legally. You're either arresting people or you are dispersing people. What they were doing on January 6th was neither. They were arresting some, but not many. They were not dispersing the crowd. What they were doing was agitating the crowd. 
And as they agitated the crowd, as people got enraged, saying, you shot my best friend in the face with, like, you know, this pellet. Uh, you, you tossed a concussion grenade at me and my elderly wife. You know, as people got enraged with that, that's when you started seeing people pushing and yelling. And that's when you started seeing fists fly. And that is when you talk about, well, was that violence or was that instigation? Was that entrapment? And then if you watch other video footage, the interesting thing is that you had two waves of protesters on January 6th. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. We, we can watch the videos. We can see this now. The narrative, the, the evidence is out there, but you can't, nobody, nobody wants to discuss it, right? There were, there were two different waves of protesters. While Trump was still speaking at the ellipse, you had a very peaceful group with Trump. But while he was speaking at the ellipse, a very not peaceful group was already at the Capitol building. You know, you have to walk there. These were not people listening to Trump's speech. They were not there listening to Donald Trump talking about all this. They went directly to the Capitol. And what happens? Got these little bicycle racks set up instead of proper fences. They had a small handful of police who had been denied repeatedly reinforcements. They were not given proper gear. They knew that there were going to be probably millions of people because the stop the steal rallies that had been happening days and days before that, many of them had very large crowds. They knew that in previous instances, you had agitators show up. There were fist fights because of Antifa and other groups, and they didn't prepare for any of that. And you have to ask why, right? And you have to ask why that was. And it was, again, Pelosi and Muriel Bowser who would have, who would have been in charge of that deployment. They didn't do it. And so these individuals show up at the Capitol while Trump is still speaking. What do they do? They tear down the bicycle barriers. They remove the no trespassing signs. A small group, they, they start the fist fights with the police. They push the police back to the Capitol doors. And then a small group of them goes into the Capitol building. And you can watch them going through on the surveillance cameras. They do a beeline straight for the big iron doors, which are so heavy, you would need artillery to destroy them. And they're automated. You have, you have to electronically open them. And they look up, they look up at the security camera and they motion to the security camera and somebody somewhere in that building opens the doors. That's oh, how the doors is... open. What? Are yeah, you I'm serious. Me? I'm serious. So you can, you can watch it. <laughs> you oh. can watch it. Yeah. And then you see other video footage of people holding the doors open, waiting people in. Um, a lot of the people who actually did break glass and so on, a lot of them got slap on the wrist charges. They're not facing the real serious stuff. And so, you know, that, that's uh, that's what happened on January 6th. Note, I should clarify as well that not a single police officer was killed by Trump supporters, um, even though the J6 committee and even some of the judges said that it is an absolute lie. They lied that it, it, that is one of the most disgusting things that happened. The, the lie claiming that Trump supporters killed police. Not a single police officer was killed. Yeah, Four people them, died that day. Four people of, died. One of, them, one of them died like a day later from a stroke. Yep. And they were trying to say that he was having his head bashed in with a fire extinguisher. New York but Times video, reported that. Yeah. The, the video evidence shows none of that. And the family it now has the autopsy. He died of a stroke, not even mm -hmm. on the same day. Yeah. Well, and yeah, so the four people who died were Ashley Babbitt, who was shot and killed by Officer Bird. Her her husband, you know, her widower is now suing over that because he believed that she was killed execution style and it was not justified. We'll see how that court case goes. Uh, another woman was uh, in one of the tunnels, actually. And again, violation of use of force. Uh, it was one of the tunnels. She was pushed into the tunnel. The police in an, in an enclosed space deployed tear gas. You don't legally do that because it sucks the oxygen out of the room. It sucks out the oxygen. You kill people by doing that. Uh, people trying to flee. Uh, she was trampled. She was being crushed. Uh, she was people. There's video footage of people trying to save her and they're begging the police. They're begging the police. Please save this woman's life. Please help her. Please help us. What are you doing? What do the police do? A female officer goes up with a club and starts beating her in the head while she's on the ground. A violation of use of force, illegal, could even constitute attempted murder. And then what happens? 
the crowd becomes enraged and they start pushing and shoving and yelling at the police because they believe the police officers are killing this woman in front of them. They're watching a woman die in front of them. They drag the woman out. They push the police back. The people push police back are now being charged with assault charges. They push the police back to save this woman's life. They're trying to save her, giving her CPR. They can't do it. They bring her back to the police and they're begging the police to save her. Uh, the police start beating them with clubs. Again, and of course, you had Trump supporters, you know, fighting back too. They got mad. They were they were, they were watching a woman die in front of them. Finally, the police decide to do something. They drag her in, and in in the new, you know, in some of the doc, two of the documentaries, we actually show this. But um, yeah, they bring her in, and they and then they do start giving CPR and they try to save her, but it's too late. Um, they, she does die. The other two people who died that day uh, died of strokes, died of heart complications, not because of any violence that we've seen. And so that's the real that's the real story of the death that day. But when elected members of Congress talk about, you know, people were killed on January 6th, that's all they say. They don't say the context. They don't say, yeah, the police murdered a woman, an unarmed woman, shot her right in the right in the neck. Right. Execu executed her like execution style. They don't say that. They don't say, yeah, a woman was trampled because uh, police deployed, you know, tear gas in an enclosed space and suffocated her and she was trampled and then she died. They don't say that. Uh, they don't talk about the real context of it. By the way, um, with her, the autopsy report was twofold. The family autopsy said that she died of, of asphyxiation, that she was killed probably by being trampled. Uh, the the official one said that she died of amphetamine overdose because she had to take um, she had to take some attention deficit disorder drug that she'd been taking her whole life, and they say that killed her. Uh, but believe what you want, we we have the video footage showing her getting trampled and suffocating, and so yeah, that that's the real story of the deaths that day. Yeah, I'm just like I'm not I'm not even a video editor, uh, but I, I mean I edit my YouTube videos. But I'm just thinking like, yeah. okay, th th this would be so easy to do. Okay, you go to where the percussion grenades come in, and you cut off you cut off that footage, right? And then you just yeah. have the footage of people going crazy and yelling and trying to get away from where that explosion happens. And then you have a voiceover that says Trump supporters attack police officers. And if you have no context, no background, nothing, all you're going to do is believe what you're told and what your eyeballs are seeing. But then you rewind it and you go, OK, here's why they were running and pushing. And you go, oh, wow, I was missing a huge piece of the puzzle. I believe the mainstream media used that to their advantage to try to yeah. brainwash all of us that Donald Trump and his supporters are uh domestic terrorists that's exactly what they've been doing yeah well it's, it's even worse than that uh they also instituted various forms of online censorship so you can't discuss the real evidence they also held the jan 6 committee they refused to release the video footage uh we're only now seeing that because the new house speaker johnson is in he's 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 trickling it out he's he's not releasing all of it right away um, and then also the J6 committee, the Democrat one, as soon as Republicans retake the House, what do they do? They delete all the evidence. They, they deleted the evidence. Why would they do that? that I, you know, the, the irony of that is that the main charge people are getting slapped with for January 6th is not, in, is not insurrection. They're getting charged with disrupting an official proceeding. That was a charge made for Enron. And the context of that charge was if you're deleting evidence needed for a criminal prosecution. Ironically, the Jan 6 committee is deleting evidence needed for a criminal investigation. Ironically, in their, in the very people trying to frame Trump supporters committed the actual applicable crime of what they're accusing others of doing, while at the same time over-interpreting the original context of disrupting an official proceeding in order to charge people with 20 years, you know, crimes that could get you thrown in prison for 20 years. Um, but by the way, that the Supreme Court is going to be looking at that case. They agreed to take it up. And so we're going to have a Supreme Court decision on whether the Enron charge disrupting an official proceeding can legally be applied to people protesting uh, Congress and so on, uh, because it was never done before. It was never applied like this before, meaning also that people who were charged with that crime could have had no way of knowing 
that they were violating it. And of course, knowingly violating a crime is, is one of the main things they look at in normal criminal prosecutions, not on not with this one, but normally. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Uh how can how can people see this movie, Josh? What's what's the best place to point them towards? Yeah, so of course this is uh, through Epic Times. I'm, I'm a journalist. Uh, I'm senior investigative reporter at Epic Times, and I do a lot of the documentaries and stuff. But you can go to a URL for this. It's Jan6realstory.com. Jan6realstory.com. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that down below. I I have more questions. Uh, we're we're just gonna have to have you back on because. Um, this is such uh, a miscarriage of justice. This is um, a mass psychosis. Uh, I, I mean, they they are they are trying to shape a narrative that is not true. And if you tell lies long enough to enough people, people think that's the truth. And so we want to get the real truth out. And so I appreciate you making this movie. I appreciate you coming on. I've been trying to track you down. Uh, to get you on. So I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing this. Um, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll put down below jan6realstory.com. And then if people want to follow you online, Josh, what's the best way to do that? Uh, they can check out my show Crossroads on Epic TV, E-P-O-C-H-TV.com. Okay, I'll put that down below as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you for coming on. And, and uh, hopefully everybody goes and watches this and can see the truth. It's a beautifully made film, the B-roll footage, uh, all of that. I hope it's just a smashing success and and we can uh, I can be a part of getting that truth out to people. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great rest of your day.